My name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And I'm glad uh, so many of you have had the wisdom to come inside today out of that beautiful weather uh, for a very special event today. Um, this event uh, in which Ambassador Jonathan Moore will address us um, is one of the Dickey Center's Great Issues Lectures. And that series of lectures pays tribute to Dartmouth President John Sloan Dickey and his belief, uh, which was reflected uh, in the Great Issues course that was taught at Dartmouth during his presidency, that an important part of a Dartmouth education should be acquiring competence in civic engagement and responsibility. And I really emphasize that. Uh, it's the commitment to do something uh, about the problems of the day that we are really engaged in. Uh, and he was particularly concerned uh, that these competencies should include understanding of complex global issues. I'm going to introduce in just a moment uh, Professor Jean Lyons, Professor Emeritus of the Government Department, uh, who will formally introduce uh, Ambassador Moore. But I simply wanted to say at this point uh, I think many of you may be aware that the Dickey Center uh, is celebrating its 25th anniversary uh, this year. Uh, we had a series of events uh, in February, and we invited uh, Jonathan Moore, Ambassador Moore, to be a visiting fellow here at Dartmouth uh, at this time uh, because we really wanted someone who had had a personal connection uh, to President Dickey and who really embodied uh, what President Dickey enjoined the students to do, to go out and make the world a better place uh, after finishing that education at Dartmouth. And Jonathan you know, embodies you know, all of those characteristics. So uh, we were delighted that he could be uh, on campus, and he is now. Uh, he's met with many students, and I think they've benefited very greatly, as have we all, uh, from his wisdom and, and insight. So now I would just like to turn the program over to uh, Professor Jean Lyons. Jean. Thank you, Ken. Well, not only did Jonathan Moore know uh, John Dickey very well, but indeed the Moore family uh, it's, it's very much Dar a Dartmouth family, uh, it's deeply Dartmouth, and he even married a woman named Katie whose, whose uh, family is even deeper Dar Dartmouth than he perhaps. So between the two of them, they're a very loyal couple. Now actually, when uh, it's instructive that we be here because in Jonathan's day, this is where the Great Issues course was taught, as he may tell you about it. And uh, the year that Jonathan took the Great Issues course, um, uh, Jonathan, uh, John Dickey was very much involved in it, gave two or three lectures, if I recall, by reading. I was not here at the time, of course. And then opened it, in, um, as a matter of fact, uh, building on what he had said at convocation your freshman year, Jonathan. He said, among other things, addressing the young men, uh, there were no young women here at the time, addressing the young men, he said, you will be known, you will be judged for all the years to come by your work, by your character, and by your conduct here. A free man is entitled to know more, less and to, make, and, to, and to ask for no more. So it's what his conduct was going to be while he was on the, the campus. Uh, it was going to sort of mold his character. And um, Jonathan did this in a variety of ways when he was here. Um, he was, for example, president of the Dartmouth Rowing Club, um, and he was uh, secretary of the undergraduate council, secretary of Pedeopolis, vice president of the Green Key Society, and um, vice president of Cask and Gauntlet, the senior honor society. He received his, actually his AB in English, not in government, and though he spent the years, most of his years, in government in one way or another, in public service. But he writes well, as you, you appreciate when you hear him speak. Uh, now, actually, when, when Jonathan was a senior and he took um, the Great Issues course, he heard a lot of people say, um, 
For example, you heard David Lilienthal uh, speaking on, uh, is there too much bigness in American life? And Lilienthal, for those of you who don't recall, um, was both the head of the Atomic Energy Commission and head of the uh, Tennessee Value Authority. He also heard Norman Thomas, interesting enough. Now, some of you will remember Norman Thomas as the perennial socialist candidate for the presidency of the United States. He was a very strong-minded man, um, and he spoke about government for the people. But interestingly enough, Jonathan also heard Thurgood Marshall. And Thurgood Marshall at the time was the general counsel for the NAACP, and of course became um, the, um, uh, won, the, won the Brown case in 1954, I think, just the year you graduated, um, and then later became a justice of the Supreme Court. And he also heard Sidney Hook, interestingly enough, Hook was talked about the ideology of international communism. And then one very directly interesting talk was given in Great Issues that year you were here, Jonathan, by Barbara Ward. I don't know if you remember that, but it was called Moral Relations in, in the International Outlook. What could be closer to morality and foreign policy? Well, Jonathan went from here, and the last thing he heard <laughs> was John Dickey again at his graduation when he said, in the years ahead, you will learn your portion of what there is in life for knowing by seeking out the meaning, the truth, and the beauty of your own experience. And Jonathan went on to have a, a, a wide experience in government and politics. <coughs> Very shortly after he left Dartmouth, he became involved in politics at the local level uh, and in a number of presidential political campaigns as well. But then became a kind of went over to the executive branch side of things and served in consecutive uh, periods in the Justice Department, in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, what we now call Human Resources, uh, in the Defense Department, and that's where I remember, I think we first met when he was in the Defense Department, and several times in, in the State Department uh, lastly, as ambassador uh, representing the United States at the UN uh, on the Economic and Social Council. Since then, he has continued working principally for the UN, though, uh, both on refugee issues and issues of humanitarian aid. And I guess it's within that scope of affairs that he became interested in the question of morality. A lot of people say, what's morality in foreign policy? Foreign policy is the pursuit of national interest. What's morality got to do with that? Well, we'll find out from Jonathan Moore. Well, Jonathan. That work. Is that working? Well, thank you, uh, Ken, and thank you, Jean. Uh, talking about my time at Dartmouth is a little heavy for me. And I must say, I was pleased to hear the review of some of the people that spoke uh, at Great Issues. I can remember some of them. I remember Harold Urey also talked, the great physicist who was asked a question in the question and answer period of whether he believed in God. <clears throat> and he thought about it for quite a while before answering. I think it was because he was trying to figure out how to answer the question, not trying to figure out whether he believed in God or not at the time. <laughs> and, he, and he didn't. I can remember Barbara Ward because we I was lucky enough to have dinner with her at John Dickey's uh, afterwards, and she gave the most incredible disquisition on different kinds of apples. 
And I remember being absolutely charmed by this. So she, any ideas I've got about morality and foreign policy didn't come from Barbara Walters, Walters excuse me, Barbara, except for the way that she lived her life. I am grateful to the Dickey Center for the privilege of being a visiting fellow for the past two terms. And the invitation, actually it's a requirement or I wouldn't be standing up here now. The invitation to deliver this lecture is a special pleasure because I knew John Dickey, as Jean has said and as Ken has said. And to this day, I am indebted to the Great Issues course, which uh, he initiated and which I took when I was a senior. Aside from trying to put aside my feelings of intimidation when I think back on who those lecturers were and what they taught us. It may be sufficiently incongruous that I am accommodating this opportunity, however, by choosing such a foolish topic that a word about how I fell into it may be appropriate, allowing me the opportunity at the outset to diminish expectations of scholarship, wisdom, or for that matter, arrogance in my remarks. This is an essay which will treat its ambitious subject modestly, one of entirely personal philosophy drawing from my own experience and reflection over several years of work in broadly speaking, the foreign policy arena. What provokes it is a sense of a radically changed world with a convergence of dramatic new forces at large which require correspondingly radical changes in perception, resolve, and strategy, which in my view will not be possible without heightened moral consciousness. I have been curious for a long time about what I felt to be a gap between the rich body of thought available to us concerning moral philosophy, spiritual values, political ideals on the one hand, and on the other, the relative absence, call it insufficient presence of it in our behavior. In this case, as represented in our foreign relations. The two realms seem to be uncomfortable with each other each more secure in a separateness, which doesn't threaten the purity of the philosophical or the reality of the practical. Why this void exists, presuming for the moment that it does, is not entirely a mystery, but my understanding of the reasons for it and awareness of the differences of opinion surrounding it has not erased my musing. I have a nagging preoccupation that various instances of flawed strategy and incompetent performance internationally could benefit from a greater moral input. I will try to explain why I am not seeking transformation here, a term which is already being abused in political rhetoric, note transformative diplomacy, for example, but rather urging a modestly yet crucially greater engagement of the moral pulse in the policy action. We have plenty of material for reference and motivation. Aristotle on virtue and service to others, Bentham and Mill on the greatest good for the greatest number, Kant relating a moral imperative to both universality and pragmatism, Hobbes seeing the world as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, but advancing moral principles based on attributes of human nature, Locke envisaging a state of nature as one of peace, goodwill, mutual assistance, and preservation. More contemporaneously, Reinhold Niebuhr wrote that, quote, the children of light must know the power of self-interest in human society without giving it moral justification, unquote. Martin Luther King Jr. declared from a Birmingham jail that, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal and natural law. Nelson Mandela combined a patient, tenacious battle against injustice with forgiveness. And even George Kennan, a champion of realism, referred in an impassioned attack on McCarthyism to 
the spiritual equilibrium of one's fellow men. In the bookstores today are scads of volumes with titles like The Moral Imagination, The Moral Animal, The Evolution of Morality, The Moral Sense, Lives of Moral Leadership. So there is a great deal of literature in the offing, a richness of thought which examines tests and charges moral reflection. The campaign rhetoric, which invoked morality in the already feverish admonitions of the candidates for the presidential nomination in both parties, is extraordinarily frequent without much restraint or definition. It is difficult to know what this signifies, certainly a sense of vulnerability with the electorate if one were to omit even such vague and oblique appeals to higher values and ideals. But with what core commitment and with what likelihood of translation into policy impetus? And if there is an appetite in the citizenry for such reassurance, could not it be that it would welcome greater translation of the language into actual governance by those elected? Or is the current application of those values and ideals in our public policy regarded as sufficient? Before going further, I need to provide some indication of what I mean by moral or morality, some definition, not requesting agreement from anyone, but just so that my point of departure can be somewhat understood. It is important to me that such an explanation not be too explicit or dogmatic, because that would be opposed to the basic thesis of this talk, which will argue that encouraging a more integrated relationship between the moral and the political depends upon simultaneously avoiding both abstract and absolute pronouncements, and in invigorating people to discover their own moral compass, to determine their own moral prescriptions. This is not to say that a lot of such effort is not going on all around us, sometimes not easily seen or obviously exhibited. Indeed, the purpose here is to stimulate more of it and ensure that such searching is undertaken respectfully, not antagonistically seeking to find agreement rather than to enhance differences. Now, such a permissive approach, being so ambiguous and wimpish, is not very satisfying, really, to anyone. But it could have the benefit of having some relationship, some relevance, both to reality and to concord. In any event, my personal definition of moral and morality can be found within the following ideas to believe in something outside yourself, to be unselfish and to nurture empathy, that which leads to the common good, fairness and kindness. Agape, love, can be translated into the well-being of the other. The core of Confucianism has been said to be learning to be human. It might be politicizing the definition too much to include protecting the weak, the powerful, helping the powerless, or a compassionate appetite for social justice. But these hallmarks comprise my definition. You pick, decide for yourself. Somebody's telling us to get ready here. <laughs> As indicated, there is a good deal of the kind of moral content suggested already present in the way we live our daily lives, in the way our institutions function, and embedded in our public policies. How much and enough are questions of subjective judgment and that is what our responsibility of searching for moral truth, assuming the belief that there is such a thing, is all about. My own working conviction, which will not surprise you, but not seeking perfection, is not enough. I recently read an article which appeared in the journal Foreign Affairs in the spring of 2003, entitled The Rise of Ethics in Foreign Policy, in which it was written that, quote, Morality, values, ethics, universal principles have taken root in the hearts, or at least the minds, of the American foreign policy community." Unquote. 
I applaud the authors for their persuasive argument that things had changed and continued to improve in this respect. And it's only fair to acknowledge that given what has happened in the intervening four years, they may have additional thoughts on the matter. <laughs> but the article was a little too optimistic, elitist, and premature for me. And thus, my own working <coughs> conviction survives. The central ideas of this essay are that the radical changes in the world we are currently living in and can reasonably project into the future make the injection of greater moral energy into our foreign policy more critical, and that if our aspirations in this respect are shaped with a recognition of the constraints of reality and of our limitations as human beings, more opportune. The shrinking, globalizing, increasingly interdependent character of our new world is conflating peoples and problems everywhere into more complex, dynamic, intersecting, invasive, and intimate relationships. There is great promise and opportunity here, and also trouble and danger. There is a mutual reciprocating vulnerability which is novel, heightened by multiple technological advances and other man-made impacts, and embodied in such phenomena as climate change and environmental degradation, nuclear proliferation, international terrorism, spreading ethnic and religious conflict, trafficking in drugs and humans, and continent-crossing diseases such as HIV, AIDS, and avian flu. Traditional geographic and political boundaries are not getting their traditional respect. Without intending to be frivolous here, a very recent example of this in the realm of religious life is the trip across the Atlantic recently by a Nigerian prelate in order to provide ecclesiastical support for an insurgent movement within the US Episcopal Church without the permission of the Archbishop of Canterbury. My God, what is the world coming to? In order to respond to these circumstances so as to assure our future survival, not only must we recognize them and upgrade our political and institutional competence to deal with them, but employ our spiritual resources as well. The material tasks require the moral ally. Even with a political mobilization the size, commitment, and coherence of which we cannot see any sign of, we must develop an understanding of the force and gathering and tractability of these converging phenomena and the difficulty inherent in attempting to bring them into a benign rather than menacing relationship with our future. Closely related, we must recognize that the evolution of the human species is not only monumentally slow, inertial, including the flourishing of any moral component in that growth, but that the complex nature of human beings contributes to this inchworm-like progress. We humans are truly mixed up. Of course, we vary in physique, intelligence, talent, motivation, temperament, and so forth. But individually, we have inconsistent and shifting qualities and are not easily subject to stereotype. In moral terms, we are often bad and good, selfish and unselfish, loving and hating, greedy and generous, intolerant and respectful at the same time. But what is the proportionality of different and sometimes conflicting characteristics and not being static? How do they vary? I am not capable of addressing such questions as, do people have moral motivation? Is there a genetic predisposition to transcendence? Is doing the right thing hardwired? And there is a lot of disagreement among the brave experts as to what the answers to these questions are. But lacking a human nature which is better understood, which makes it difficult to plot a trajectory of an enhanced moral presence in the behavior of institutions and the design of policy, it is important for us to keep in mind this mix in our human character, the complexity of human nature and the limitations of what human beings are capable of. While nurturing our moral qualities, we must fully appreciate our overall complexity and respect all of the jumbled aspects which comprise each whole. We can do morally better with what's already part of us, 
stimulated by the world's new challenges, and we must demand more of ourselves, but not much more than we have already gotten to be. Hence the modesty required in the endeavor. I realize it's heretical to ask that we act more moral, yet marginally so. But we shouldn't overdo it. The traffic, our traffic won't bear it. We won't get far by treating the world as more malleable and the human species as less resistant than they are. There are three other preconditions, in a sense, prior restraints, which need to be appreciated given the goal of affecting a better integration of the moral and the existential realms. The first is the need to avoid separatist thinking, the tendency to think in opposites, the inclination to focus on differences ahead of affinities. An extreme version of this is Manichaeanism, dividing into good and evil, good versus evil. We often try to simplify and deconstruct complex matters into more manageable and understandable categories and compartments. This is familiar behavior, often useful in both academic and political activity, but sometimes it can create false dichotomies. Consider for a moment two competing schools of thought in international relations, realism and idealism. Of course, it is useful to conceptualize and analyze the character and conduct of foreign policy with these models. But the truth of the matter is that in practice, any serious foreign policy has got to figure out how to combine both crit critically valuable elements. That is where the challenge is understanding the interplay and reinforcement, and devoting our intellectual and political energy to that. So separatism is basically, uh, is generally speaking, a bad habit, given the size, complexity, and intensity of the problems of the world we now live in. And in times of stress and anxiety, it contributes to polarization. We require instead more commitment and effort to find ways of matching and linking of connecting ideas and interests, solutions and people. The second key requisite which emerges here is the relationship between morality and pragmatism. We want to keep each from being corrupted by the other. One is more abstract, the other is very proximate. We sense that there would be risk and difficulty to conceive and manage a synthesis which could benefit both, a prodigiously delicate balance. I've already asserted that good policy needs more moral content, that practical, workable strategies have a better chance if they are not segregated from moral values. But the other side is perhaps more profoundly true. Without application, the moral imperatives have no active life. They remain pristine, uncorrupted by the nasty instrumental pressures of being put into practice and therefore essentially inert, worthless. To be moral is to be operational. We understand that the two are not antithetical, but they will be effectively so if they are not, if they do not become active collaborators. Third, it follows from an understanding of a reinforcing connection between the moral and the pragmatic that an absolutist or fundamentalist approach applying moral values and dealing with real challenges will not work. Intolerant extremism or rigid dogma can be harmful to the purpose. There are too many moral imperatives and too great a complexity in the environment of need and action. Consider the huge differences in human circumstances and the huge varieties in human culture and in the values attached to them across the globe, which somehow must be reconciled. We need tolerance, flexibility, compromise in the search for common ground in our public discourse and public policy. Just in our own American culture and beliefs, there are nagging trade-offs, competing and sometimes even colliding altruistic convictions, moral principles, which need somehow to be both respected and discriminated when contemplating the survival of a shared human community which we would want to be part of. Several examples are available in the field of humanitarian action, assistance, and intervention, 
in which I have had some particular exposure, as was mentioned. Should NATO bomb Kosovo using military force against massive violations of human rights, but causing extensive collateral damage, what an evasive euphemism, to innocence and civilian life? Should we impose sanctions on the de facto military government in Haiti when they exacerbate the already grinding despair of the Haitian peasantry? Should we abandon a humanitarian mission in Somalia which has saved tens of thousands of lives because of a disastrous intervention in a civil war? Should desperately needy refugee populations in eastern Zaire continue to be assisted when that help enables militants in control of the camps to, terror to terrorize the inhabitants and marshal military forays back into Rwanda? Should refugees in neighboring Southeast Asian countries be forcibly repatriated to Vietnam as a way of alleviating desperate circumstances and a resettlement stalemate in their camps? Should a Soviet Saudi airlift to feed the isolated besieged population in Kabul be foiled in order to aid the Mujahideen surrounding the Afghan capital to liberate it from the communists? Should the refugee assistance budget be cut for Mozambicans clothed in bark to increase the resettlement budget for Jews freed to leave the Soviet Union and flooding to America? What's more important in the post-genocidal political and legal life in Rwanda? Social justice, punishment, or peaceful reconciliation, forgiveness? These are real dilemmas from the recent past, and there are many more across wide-ranging areas of policy, even more profound and stubborn today. In order to deal with them, soul-wrenching choices must be made and nerve-rattling compromises must be attempted. Moral certainty isn't the way to do this, whereas moral search is. And in that very distinction, there is the very necessity for adaptation, flexibility, respect, and risk to get a result somewhere in the middle, which doesn't satisfy anyone, but which may be a way to begin to get out of trouble and head toward a viable future if not all the way to the promised land. It's occurred to me that my opinion here may be tantamount to or vulnerable to accusation of moral relativism. Well, depending upon the definition, this is probably true. It isn't that I like giving up the dream of pure, unbesmirched moral principle. It's that I don't think it works, and if it doesn't work, it isn't validated. So I think moral absolutism can be self-indulgent, even delusional, ultimately harmful. There are too many strong moral constructs for any one to own the truth by itself or for there to be only one truth. Morality isn't something that's owned, but something which is sought. It isn't to be imposed, but to be shared. Its spirituality doesn't exist apart from, but is joined with the material reality where it operates. So I have concocted a convergence of three factors. One, a radically narrowed planet with intimations about our survival. Two, the availability of moral attitudes and principles which are not fully enough embodied to help us respond adequately to new challenges. Three, a still evolving human species of mixed qualities and limited capacity unable to advance very quickly. There is obviously a paradox here between the scale of the crisis we are heading for and our limitations in responding to it. The answer to this is to recognize the realities and constraints involved, mobilize our full talents and assets, including a stronger moral drive, and commit ourselves to the long haul, expecting trouble and setbacks along the way. We can't expect too much too fast. There are no quick or tidy fixes here, 
the complexity of our environment and ourselves doesn't allow it. We've got to develop greater moral consciousness, but we can't be complacent about how much, how soon, or about our ability to overwhelm the threatening forces, some of which are our own making. Our best hope is painful, hopefully gradual progress, which itself will require major change. And either the failure of sufficient commitment or the delusion of quick transformation could lead to demoralization, cynicism, and shrinking back into selfishness and hostility. Assuming that there is some truth in all this, what does it mean to our foreign policy, which is the principal agency for advancing our goals in the international context? Recognizing that what we are domestically, what is happening at home, is fundamental to any foreign policy. It is important to establish that in this democratic republic, we need a polity which is more seriously engaged in self-government. In order for that to happen, it needs to be better informed, which in turn requires an overall multimedia, multi-level educational system, which teaches everybody in school, on television, with the internet, in our national discourse, more about the scared new world we live in. Ideally, this would result in a broader, less nationalistic redefinition of our national interest, so that it encompassed the international interest of people very distant and different from us. Also, here at home, the process by which policy is made should be backed up by commitment to more truth-telling, candor, and honesty, greater integration and coherence of the various components and interests in policymaking, focusing on a much longer time frame, better emphasis on preparation and capacity for on-the-ground implementation of policy abroad, and more inclusive participation in the process to achieve better choices and greater consensus. Ideally, the process of foreign policy decision-making should also incorporate some frame of reference for policymakers to use, perhaps in the form of a checklist of searching questions which could focus on particular aspects of the given issues being examined to assure that moral goals not be ignored in the deliberations. There are various models available for doing this, a prominent one being just war theory, which articulates standards to guide decisions on the use of military force. Although the US is the world's only hyperpower, we remain the most powerful by a large margin. There are now many problems in the world which affect our interests with growing, inter with growing influence over which our power, as presently constituted and deployed, is inapt, or at least not powerful enough to have a reliably salutary and lasting impact. Effective American power is waning. This is due to a number of factors, including the gathering forces enumerated previously, which are part of the new and multiple interdependency, which individual states and the international community do not have the will or means to handle emerging nations forming new distributions of power in the world, and a U.S. not having yet figured out just what is going on and how to deal with it, both in terms of a political consensus at home and coherent strategies abroad. It is a daunting challenge. The way isn't clear. And in our thrashing around, we may be discovering some answers, but we're getting behind the curve. Thomas Homer Dixon see some of the major threats converging so that we need to prepare in advance to deal with simultaneous multiple stresses which tend to interact and reinforce one another. There are five big issues in foreign policy which I have selected to briefly sketch as examples of the kinds of tough problems we face which carry great urgency and yearning for a moral leadership which does not deny the formidable realities and requirements, but rather seeks to integrate and elevate what practically must be done. The characteristics of each represent the framing and criteria which I've been wrestling with. 
the sketches are disappointing, not so much in their brevity, but because they are not dispositive. No solutions, merely continuing searches. What we can do, the U.S. in concert with others, remains open-ended, intimidating, murky, exciting, and hopeful. The first and most all-encompassing challenge is the gap between the haves and the have-nots, the rich and the poor. It is gaping and grotesque and growing and deleteriously affects many other interests we share, including ethnic conflict, disease, energy, environmental degradation, and terrorism. Quite logically, it is a spectacular manifestation of moral and material confluence, the two realms inseparable in the existential reality and in any prescription. It is poverty magnified, and it generates hostility and despair. It could be beyond us, too late for us to reverse the trend. For the U.S. and other nascent states who are hypothetically capable of making the huge investment to do so, a currently unimagined perception of what its meaning is for us, our physical and spiritual survival and the future of our planet, would be required. We don't get it. We don't really think it's our risk. Our concern and our ongoing efforts are reluctant and puny. The developing world will also have to make huge effort, although of a different type, to gain the needed stability, discipline, and time. And that's just as long a wager. With a regenerated perception might come the necessary priority producing major sacrifice, the willingness to make major sacrifice, and prolonged, virtually permanent commitment. But it seems that this would have to be driven by a combination of fear and moral wake-up. The second foreign policy category is the environment and energy. At the Rio Summit on the Environment and Development in 1992, as a disgruntled member of the U.S. delegation squirming under instruction from Washington, I became painfully aware of the relationship between the environment and undevelopment. The Third World delegations had earlier refused to discuss only environment and not development. Under their pressure, the latter had been added to the agenda and the title of the summit. And they turned the conference into a teach-in against the proposition being foisted on them that they needed, in effect, to curtail their development in order not to contribute further to the environmental crises produced by the development which had already been achieved by the advanced nations. The summit did some negotiating and some papering over, was incapable of grasping the full import of this impasse, and the plans and commitments it coughed up eventually largely petered out. The ubiquitous nature of environmental phenomena and the urgency shared with everyone for dealing with them to the common benefit has not yet stirred us to change our ways to control our appetites and inspire our resolve so as to seriously deal with it. More recently, man-made global warming has become more accepted and more severe, and it has become clearer that the negative impact of climate change affects the poor more than the rich. Thus, the connection between the rich-poor gap and environmental trouble is established. The latter exacerbates the former. I will not review here the helter-skelter for oil and the nascent awareness of the need to develop alternate energy sources, which obviously compounds the problem. The third illustrative area is foreign assistance, including, for my purposes, Official Development Assistance, ODA, from well-heeled to deprived members of the international community. Ongoing UN programs by its operational and specialized agencies under the Security Council radar. Humanitarian intervention, including military force to relieve massive suffering and human rights violations. And nation building in all of its many parts. Humanitarian relief, peacekeeping and security, political and diplomatic efforts, the four R's, rehabilitation, reconstruction, reintegration, and reconciliation, institution building, longer term development, and so on. This is a hodgepodge of need and response, 
requiring elevated investments, priority setting and resource allocation, synchronization, and matching the type of assistance which the donor can muster to the kind of incapacity which the beneficiary suffers. Discipline and ingenuity on getting a science foreign assistance right lag behind some very good analyses of what's wrong with it. One of the major problems within this general realm of foreign policy, which is particularly vexing, is how to undertake development amidst insecurity, the security development nexus. It's not enough simply to say, even though it's true, that security comes first and what without it there's no development possible because there are so many countries which are conflict prone and require development for them to get out of insecurity. First hand experience with provincial reconstruction teams, a serious operational initiative in Afghanistan, exhibits, a major, exhibits major structural and political obstacles. Their development and security components do not mesh in these teams and military priorities tend to take precedent and often undercut the socioeconomic programs. Yet, this is a serious concept being undertaken in the field, which is the only place to get at the problem. The fourth case is the global war against terrorism, a phraseology I use only to be able to call attention to its strikingly inane and harmful mischaracterization. Our anti-terror policies have tended to emphasize the wrong things, pretending it is, an, it is an isolatable and conventionally defeatable enemy, acting as if we can oppose it unilaterally, not taking care to understand its culture and motivation, pretending its sponsors and troops are beyond politics, outside the human species, and believing that terrorism has no relationship to poverty and social injustice, that we don't need to confront its root causes over an indefinite period. Moreover, we have failed to recognize the integral connection between our strategies international and domestic realms. That is to say, we haven't nurtured the protection of our civil liberties and the shoring up of our social contract at home, and we haven't refurbished our infrastructure or engendered a public attitude of sacrifice. These all being bulwarks of not just homeland security, but necessary armament in the intertwined cause. I want to be clear that in my mind, our military power is an essential component in the response to terrorism, as well as to other threats. My mother would be disappointed that this isn't a pacifist screed. It is a matter of how and when, and not whether our military policy, our military power should be exercised. One of the most embedded habits in human beings being our violent nature. The fifth issue I've chosen is multilateralism, which is inherent to each of the other categories and related in some dimension to every aspect of foreign policy. This does not mean just the UN but many other in international institutions, NGOs, alliances, partnerships, and programs. And it does not mean that unilateral action has to be sacrificed, prohibited, quite the contrary. But it does mean that we've got to contain our nationalism and recognize the huge importance of multilateralism to our national interest by consistently supporting it. This is not new, but is not honored. Professor Gene Lyons recently wrote that we are sidestepping, quote, whether it is in the interest of the United States to go further and strengthen the range of institutions and processes that make up international society, unquote. Working at and with the UN and refugee assistance worldwide, negotiating the first unanimous anti-apartheid revolution resolution for South Africa in the General Assembly, reshaping a multi-year commitment, a multi-year development program for Sub-Sahara Africa, banning drip net fishing, helping to design justice systems in poor countries recovering from war. It was clear every day 
to me both that these urgent problems could not possibly be seriously approached except multilaterally, and also how well the UN persistently helped serve US interests. I'm sure you will permit me to finish up. <laughs> Given the bind we are in, having no one to depend upon but us human beings to successfully engage truly prodigious challenges which now confront all of us and are gathering speed and convergence, when the limitations of our nature and the time it takes for us to evolve and change in the face of new forces might be too great, what do we do? I don't know enough to tell anybody else. My feeling is that, being observant about the realities we face and our own limitations, we must connect with our fellow humans across the globe and using all our best resources, resolve to take small steps across unending time, doggedly slogging. Strangely, we need to affect bigger changes than we have yet proved we are capable of in order just to get these steps underway and to keep taking them. We need the mobilization to work the trade-offs the compromises, to be patient with our imperfections and to have an appreciation of our weaknesses, and constantly to, to seek the balance among the contending qualities and interests, good and bad. Elliot Richardson wrote that, quote, only by the constant pursuit of balance among the elements of change can we induce the flow of events to bring us closer to where we want to go, a society in which all of us can be and become our whole selves." Unquote. To beat Yeats's rap, holding the center by claiming our conviction without being overcome by passionate desire. This is our prodigious foreign policy undertaking. Thank you. Sure. Uh, would anybody? Presumably, you're not as exhausted as I am, so you might have a couple of questions. I have a question. Sir. Uh, sir, there is something admired in the timing of international terror or terror. Just when you're finished with the Soviets and you have the capacity to deal with some other evil, Arabs go evil. The timing is admired. Now, my question is. Then you are ready to take on China with Arabs as nicely stop being evil so that you can deal with China with all your might. Shall I repeat the question? If I understood your question, I don't think I know how to answer it. But I will say this and then tell me what I missed. Uh, we. No, let me. Let me make it. Soviets are no more. They are kaput. You have time. Arabs go in. Next, when you're ready for China, you're not ready for China now. When you're ready for China, of course, China will be the manifest evil. Bring the Arabs and stop being evil so that you can concentrate on one evil at a time. Did you, did, you, did you bring the Arabs into that? Did I hear you wrong? Well, presently, the, the war against terror is Arab. Yeah, but it isn't only Arab. I mean, essentially, Having gotten through the, 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 the uh, Second World War and having gotten through the, the Cold War, the post-war, Cold War period, and with the changes that you've indicated that have taken place in the Soviet Union, we now have an opportunity with these converging forces I'm talking about to really look at the world very differently, including China. We've got to look at China, who is, who is not facing us down the way the Soviet Union was, uh, in, order to, in order to figure out a way to join interests and make compromises and, and uh, I mean, 
there is more in, in common and more interests are shared, even between, maybe particularly between China and the United States, than there are differences. So we've got to figure out a way to exploit that. And that takes patience and compromise, not naivete. We can't be, we can't be silly and foolish about it. But we've got to look upon China much more as, a, as a, uh, an opportunity than a threat. Or if we look upon China as a threat, we have to look upon it as a threat which we're going to solve in very different ways than we've solved in the past. Next question. Don't, don't, don't try to ask that again because I don't think I can answer it. Yes. Um, you said it's a challenge to our country. It's a very grand academic speech. But if you were to address the English doctor, what would the grand dogged slogging. I mean, first of all, there are some, there may be some people in this audience, but there certainly are some people on this campus that would not involve, would not characterize my talk as being academic. I sort of thought I was being practical. So maybe I've missed both constituencies. But what I would urge them to do, and, and I've been doing a lot of urging uh, in, with the wonderful opportunities I've had to, to uh, spend a lot of time with, with undergraduates while I've been here on campus as a Dickey visiting fellow, and I've learned a lot more from them than I've been able to uh, convey, or than I've been confident about conveying to them. And what I've said is, and what I'll say and answer your question is, first of all, do something that, that makes you happy to be doing. Don't do something arbitrary or conventional or that, that you think will, will uh, be, quote, successful, unquote, and that will give you repute. And if all of that fits together, fine. But do figure out who you are and what really will make you happy doing, and then go try to do that. I think if you're going to work in the international arena nowadays, it, it's going to be helpful to, to have a graduate school study behind you, a graduate degree, and there are very, all sorts of graduate degrees you can get to pursue international work. I think it's probably better to get some actual experience in between a Dartmouth education and the, uh, and the uh, uh, further graduate study. You're going to know more about who you are and what kind of study you want with that interval. And then look at your talents, look at your opportunities, and figure out what your ideals are and, and uh, proceed. I don't, I don't know any other way to put it. I'm not sure that, that enough students do do that now, although I'm not a student and I don't probably really understand, and I, or I may be wrong in my perception. But I think that all of us, including, and I don't, I don't separate myself from the students that much, all of us are, uh, tend to look for too much perfection and look for too much progress too soon. There's a feeling, particularly in this culture, that can do and can do fast, and it'll make me a big deal and make me some, you know, make me financially viable. I think, actually, that to make progress in life that is that is beyond your own selfishness takes that dogged slogging, and I think that the recognition of that will reduce impatience and uh, despair and will commit you to keeping going. The key thing is to figure out what the balance is, that, that creative balance that Elliot Richardson was talking about, between your, your own immediate personal, you could call them selfish needs, and the relationship between them and what uh, needs to be done for the other, for in an, in an unselfish way. Not to, not to renounce the first, but to, but to figure out how the two work together. 
Yes, Sarah. I work as a medical setting, and you have a, um, a dilemma, an ethical dilemma. You call an ethics consult, and there's a formal board that helps you solve that problem. And I wondered if George Bush wanted an ethics consult, um, who could he go to? Is there any sort of formal committee or board um, to help him make those decisions or foreign policy decisions at that level? No. And, uh, and, and if there was, I would want to look at the board very carefully. Uh, what I was trying to suggest were some techniques that aren't outlandish, whereby you could introduce more of a systematic way to, uh, to consider moral uh, ideas, or at least not fail to invite them to be part of the deliberation. I think, you, I think that has to be done more systematically, but not too systematically. Once it becomes too formal, it'll break down. And there are these guides. There is a, a National Security Memorandum Directive, which the National Security Council produced in 1994, which has all sorts of guidance about under what circumstances you consider humanitarian intervention with, with military forces. It's very, very useful. The just war theory is very, very useful bunch of criteria considerations that you apply. The point is not to come out with a, not to uh, come up with an arbitrary formula, which then you apply in cases, but to get you to be as creative and as imaginative as possible, still being pragmatic and realistic, uh, to uh, figure out how to, how to thread the needle, not, not leave moral considerations out. One of the interesting things that happens is that I was, I was doing some, some writing about humanitarian intervention and, and when uh, uh, decisions about humanitarian intervention have gone awry or were just messy and sloppy and not, not uh, deliberate enough. And I, and I came up with the idea that, which I actually mentioned in my talk in a different context, that in order to make decisions about humanitarian intervention, the decision makers have got to think beyond the initial military operation as to what the connections are to rehabilitation, reconstruction, nation building, which follow, and have got to understand much better than we're in the habit of doing what actually is the culture, what's happening on the ground, what's, what the forces, what the interests are, what the dynamic is, so that we're prepared to deal with all of that before we go in. Well, that's very interesting, because if you do that really well, and you believe that uh, the moral and the pragmatic, the moral and the operational have, have got to work together, you'll come up with so many reasons for not going in that the whole moral drive to relieve human rights violations by the intervention of outside, uh, presumably more benign forces than the inside authorities, becomes moot. So already you've got, you're right in the, in the, in the vortex of, of, the, of the dilemma of making moral decisions because you immediately encounter other moral considerations and imperatives than the ones you have in mind and they're in competition with each other you will not get them automatically resolved together. So that's where that gut-wrenching effort to make those choices and make those, uh, those, that, that calculus come in. Yes? Is studying the curve? Oh, me, who's ahead of the curve? You're probably ahead of the curve. <laughs> I don't think anybody's ahead of the curve. I mean, you're talking about nation states or individuals? I mean, I, I, I get that nation states. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of the Scandinavian states, as you know, and, and adding the Netherlands, probably Canada, have got seem to have a more responsible attitude about 
humanitarian and development assistance to poor countries, which is pretty well integrated into their own domestic politics than we do. But we're capable of being ahead of the curve in some very important areas, not excluding military action, uh, which the Scandinavian countries and, and, and others aren't. Uh, I mean, look at South Africa and the extraordinary leadership that they provided the world by what they did to get rid of apartheid and by the, by the remarkable leadership of Nelson Mandela. Really inspirational. I mean, really, it's a model. And so South Africa is in terrible shape right now. So I'm not confident that I'm, asking, that I'm answering your question. And I find it somewhat questionable that you should come such a long distance and be so nasty to me in the Q&A session. <laughs> But, but that's, there may be some people who are ahead of the curve on some things and not on others. I mean, if you develop some sort of taxonomy which could measure this, you, you might put China ahead of everybody else in terms of being ahead of the curve. But there are enormous uh, dangers which lurk there, not dangers so much to people outside of China, but to people inside China. Yes. The basic problem about the United Nations is that the people who have the most influence the masters of the United Nations. The United Nations, as you well know, is, is only a, a concatenation of its membership. And that means that the powerful members have more influence in running the, the United, Nation, United Nations and in determining its effectiveness and its relevance and its strength more than the weak nations do, even though the weak nations or the poor nations or the developing nations are much more numerous. The, the big st states, uh, the most rich and powerful states, which have the most influence in the United Nations, have not yet decided that they really want the United Nations to be that powerful. When I was working at the United Nations, I figured out that my own country, the United States, was a member of the United Nations and actively participating in it for three reasons. One is to get it to do what the United States wanted it to do for the United States. The, other, the next was to keep the United Nations from doing things that the, that the United States didn't like, which might affect them. The third was to contribute over time by giving up some notions of one's own uh, national self-importance and, and sovereignty and, and uh, national interests even only marginally, to, to truly invest institutionally and politically into a, into a really robust United Nations. And I realized that that third commitment or that third part of the United States involvement and membership in the United Nations really wasn't there very much. So, most of the reforms in the United Nations, without saying that they're not important, because they are important, are paltry, and other reforms are, are, are fraudulent. And let's say that there are, there are good reforms, and there are. How do you make them stick? It's, it's, a, it's a long haul to make them stick, because the people who have the real, the, the nation states who have the real influence to making those good reforms work are not yet all that convinced that they want the UN to be strengthened to the degree that those form reformers might strengthen them if that gets into a situation where the UN is opposed to the national interest of the, of the given countries. So we're still in this. And we haven't 
we haven't gotten very far. I, I think that the UN is much more durable and, and, uh, and enduring. It has more stamina than, than uh, we tend to think, particularly when the UN has failed, unquote, uh, in its mission or when the UN is opposed to the US. I think it's, 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 it's going to be around for a long while, and I think it's going to be stronger. And I think the reason it's going to be stronger is that people, this is unduly rational on my part, I apologize, having given some considerable attention to the non-rational in my remarks. But I think that na peoples and nation states are going to come to a much greater realization that we're all in it together, and that there is this interdependence which is affecting everybody, and you cannot keep dangers from crossing borders into your, in your territory. And that greater sense of the need for international cooperation uh, in, in the common interest for the common good is going to result in, in uh, the people, the nation states who actually control what goes on in the UN to be much more supportive and, and much more committed to building an institution. Yes. No question that it would. And it's, hap <clears throat> it's happening. And it's happening in other countries more than it's happening in our country or with other, <clears throat> with, with, with other actors and authorities who are playing important roles in international initiatives than it is here. It's already happening. It's got a long way to go. But the, if, if your question is, will more gender parity, or will the, will the power and influence and participation of more women benefit <clears throat> our overall efforts to find a w ways to live together in this world? No question. Badly needed. Other questions? You've been a very sweet audience. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jonathan.